Welcome to the new year. We are going to be doing chapter five now. So video five one, we're going to talk about how we measure the distance traveled. Remember that distance is velocity times time. So suppose we have the graph of a car's velocity. Let me show you right here. And I want to figure out how far they traveled. We remember that we are looking for the area under the curve. Remember that velocity is the derivative of distance. So we're really trying to go back a step here. So I have this lovely, lovely slope right here. Okay, we can see that the velocity of this graph, if I'm talking about the function, is 3 over 4t. That's just the slope. If I want to figure out the distance traveled, I'm going to do 1 half base times height because I'm working with a triangle right here. So the distance one half a base of 12 times a height of 9. So 0.5 times 12 times 9. And we have 54 feet traveled. Now, realistically in real life, not everything is a perfect continuous speed function of that linear line that a lot of times we have things that are accelerating. So I have a curved function. Looking at this, this one just happens to be a perfect quarter circle. So I can go ahead and say area is one fourth pi r squared. I can find out that the radius is 14. So that means that my area is one fourth times 196 times pi, and that comes down to 49 pi feet. And now perfect, again, if life is perfect and you have always perfect quarter circles. Realistically in life, life does not move that way. We have increasing, decreasing. So we want to look at what happens when I'm given a time and velocity table here and figure out how fast they traveled. Okay, so we can see it was checking in every two seconds and we can see the velocities at that time. If we're going to look first, okay, zero to two, and I'm going to pick up here and say, all right, at zero, I was traveling that speed of 10 seconds, so I must have carried that sp exact speed for those two seconds. I want a total distance of 20. From 2 to 4, now I have the 15. So 15 times 2, that makes the 30. Keep going with that plan. 22 times 2, there's the 44. 20, 30 times 2, there's the 60. And then 42 times 2 is the 84. And I add that up, and that says that my total distance was 238. Now, that may not be what happened. I could have been going zero right, excuse me, been going 10 right at zero and then switched over to the 15 at point zero 0.01. I don't know. So now I'm going to look at it and say, well, what if for the first two seconds I was going 15? Well, then I've accumulated 30 and then I got the 44 and then the 60 then the 84, and then using the 60 for the last two seconds, now I went 120. So that total is 338. Big difference there, looking at how, what the speeds were. We have one that looks like a very low estimate and one that looks like a higher estimate. Now, we're going to look at this graph right here. And we're going to see the lower estimate, and we're going to see the upper estimate, okay? We have the values already calculated, and we saw that when I did and went from the left side here, starting and using the 10 and then moving up, that that gave me the lower estimate of the 238. And when I started from the right side, the top here, the max, that gave me the upper estimate. Now, it's really nice to have those two second intervals, but it would be even more specific if I knew more data. 
So looking now, it's telling me what happened at every single second. So you can see the graph of it down here. Very pretty, very nice. You can see how it's in, if you wanted to describe it, increasing and concave up. So now I'm just going to say, all right, instead of using the 2 for my time, I'll be using the 1. So 1 times the 10, 1 times the 12, 1 times the 15, 1 times the 18, 1 times the 22, 1 times the 26, 1 times the 30, I'm running out of room here, 1 times the 38, 1 times the 42, and 1 times the 52. That gets me all 10 seconds gone through, and I have a total of 265. So at that point, that's the minimum I'm guessing because it's increasing. I can also look and now look at the maximum value and say, okay, 1 times 12, 1 times 15, 1 times 18, 1 times 22, 1 times 26, 1 times 30, 1 times 38, 1 times 42, 1 times 52, and 1 times 60. And that gets me a total of 315 when I add those together. So I can see the minimum estimate and the maximum, the over and under. What you want to be thinking about here visually, if I'm going with the 10, it's making that little rectangle right there. That's the area underneath that we are dealing with. So you can see why this was the underestimate because literally the area that I am finding is under the curve. I am always losing that section at the top, right? You can see those little slivers. I'll just put a dot on them so you can tell you what I'm talking about. Those little slivers are not getting accounted for. Now, when I went and went from the larger values, you can see now those are covering extra distance that didn't actually occur. And this is why it's considered the overestimate because it's literally over the curve. You can see all of this extra space that I don't actually have. With that, the difference between the lower and the upper estimate, we want to figure out would be obviously better each time that we made it smaller. So a tenth of a second. So if I had to do the 60 minus the 10, because that's the interval I've been working with, then times the one tenth of a second, that comes out to be a five foot difference. If I then looked at the max and the min and multiplied by the hundredth of a second, that's only half a foot difference. And if I go even smaller, then I'm 0 0.05. So we have here, find the upper and lower estimates for this velocity graph. So this is one that you are going to try. You're going to see what we have here that now I'm counting by threes. Okay. The underestimate is going to be 216 and the over is going to be 291. So take a second, make sure you can get those values. Now, if the function is decreasing, the rectangles from the left are going to be less than the rectangles from the right. You want to be aware how we're talking here, that now, going from the left, that would now be the overestimates. Okay? Okay. 
So because upper and lower is not going to be always in the same place, we tend to just make our life easier here and say that we're going to have delta t, which is b minus a over n. So a and b are the n points, and n is the number of intervals. So the left-hand sum starts with the first position. Here's the notation for it, that it's going to be f of t sub 0 times the delta t plus f of t sub 1 times delta t. And that's all the way up to f of t n minus 1 times delta t. The right-hand sum starts 1 over, so f of t sub 1 times delta t, f of t sub 2, that's a weird parenthesis, times delta t. And this one goes all the way up to f of t sub n times delta t. So finding the left and right hand sums, going through these questions first, delta t, remember, is b minus a over the n. So in this case, 23 minus the 15 over 4. And that is 2. So we're going to be going by 2s. When I'm talking about t sub 0, this is t sub 0, this is t sub 1, this is t sub 2, t sub 3, t sub 4. f of t sub 0 is right here, f of t sub 1, and so on. So we've gone through c, and then the left and right hand sums, I'll do one of them for you, is going to be 2 times 15 plus Oh, no, I'm so sorry. 10 times 2 plus 13 times 2 plus 18 times 2 plus 20 times 2 is 122. You can go ahead and find the other one, and the right-hand sum will be 162. Now you're going to try this one, and I want you to just notice delta t in this situation makes life a little more stressful. You want to go through and see that there isn't a specific value that's always the same. So that will affect what you do. It just changes that each delta t is different. When you get down, you'll be able to label all the parts. And in D, you're going to have a left and right hand sum of 216. Negative velocity is the last thing we need to deal with here. We have sections of the graph that are above the x-axis, positive velocity, and sections that are below negative velocity. So this, if I have A1 and this is A2, the areas in that location, A1 is positive, A2 sub two is negative. So if I subtract the values, now I can find the total distance, okay? So you want to look at the question as they asking you for total distance or how total displacement. So I'm looking at this graph here, and I do area right here is 2 times 3, that's 6. So, and then I do this section right here, 2 times the 3 as well because this one goes down to negative 3, is negative 6. So if they're asking me total distance, I'm going to say 12. If they're asking me the displacement that I went, I went 6 away and then came back that same 6, so I have a displacement of 0. You're going to look at B and do the area of the triangle. First, the displacement is 15, but the total distance is 17. So take a second to try that. Have a great night, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.